Welcome to Witnessing Faith with Bishop Duane. I'm Karen Barry Schwartz, Director of Communications for the Diocese of Venice in Florida. Witnessing Faith with Bishop Duane can be heard here on Relevant Radio on 1410 AM and 106.7 FM in Fort Myers, and 1660 AM and 93.3 FM in Naples, or anytime at dioceseofvenice.org slash rbishop. Your Excellency Bishop Duane, welcome back to Relevant Radio. Karen, thank you. It's good to be back with you and all our listeners. Bishop, we're about to enter a very special time, of course, in the church, Holy Week, and we'll be talking about that this morning. But perhaps we might want to begin with a special prayer, as tomorrow is April 1st, the first day of Child Abuse Prevention Month. Perhaps you might lead us in prayer for victims and survivors of abuse. All right, I'll do that. Let's begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God of endless love, ever caring, ever strong, always present, always just. Hear the cries of our brothers and sisters who have been gravely harmed and the cries of those who love them. Soothe their restless hearts with hope. Steady their shaken spirit with faith and grant them justice for their cause, enlightened by your truth. Holy Spirit, comforter of hearts, Heal your people's wounds and transform brokenness into wholeness. Grant us the courage and wisdom, humility and grace to act with justice. Breathe wisdom into our prayers and labors. Grant that all harmed by abuse may find peace and justice. And as always, we do ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Bishop. Today, as the end of Lent draws near, we'll be talking about Lent a little bit and Holy Week and the great joy of our faith, Easter. Bishop Duane and I are joined today by a special guest, Father Eric Scanlon, pastor of Incarnation Church in Sarasota in the Diocese of Venice. Good morning and welcome, Father. Father, welcome. I hope you enjoy being here with us today. Yes, good to be with you both. Well, let's begin this morning by talking a little bit about Lent, which we are still in, and as we near its close this coming Thursday, I like the theme, Bishop, that the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops has given to Lent this year, which is simply reflect, repent, and restore. I've been trying this Lent to devote more time to daily reflection and prayer, and I've found it to be very helpful and lovely, actually. And I'm just wondering, how has your Lenten journey been, Bishop and Father? Well, I'll start maybe my... Personal Lenten journey, I think I always start out with a high goal, and some days I'm a lot better at it than other days. I'll just be honest. I think that's a human condition. However, looking at that reflect, repent, restore idea, I think for me it's been a a time of repent, a time of looking around what it is we as, as church do and how we do it. Particularly on this day, one thinks of those who have been abused. And I think we have to be cognizant of that and aware of it always as we're out and about meeting people to that sensitivity and be aware, be listening, be be feeling with our heart, I think, is someone talking to me about that. So during the Lenten season, I've tried to take a look at that, that very real kind of thing and keep it very much alive in my prayer life. You know, we're also called to look at fasting, prayer, and almsgiving. The fasting, okay, one picks out what they want, one knows the rules, prayer. We have our prayer life regular, but to add to that in this season, and particularly, as I mentioned, to think about those who have been harmed in some way by some action of the church or or someone who represented the church. That's a great thought, certainly as we approach this next month of April for victims. Father, how about you? How has your personal Lenten journey been going this year? Yes, like as Bishop mentioned, ups and downs, and some days are better than others. But one of the things that I love the church offers us the opportunity during the Lenten season is we're entering into this experience of the desert with Jesus, right? And, you know, that experience of the desert, it offers us the opportunity to focus on what's really important in our life, to let go of the superficial and the non-essential, and to listen, to spend some time in silence, to reflect, to repent. And we do this with the Lord, and we do this seeking to grow closer to Him and and to let go of those you know parts of ourselves that maybe we struggle with, those weaknesses, those sins, and and really to recommit ourselves to Him. And you know that's the beautiful thing about Lent; it's an opportunity to 
to really renew our faith and our relationship with him. I just think, Father, I'd like your opinion on this. During this particular Lent, we have so many really magnificent readings in the Gospels on Sunday. Of course, all the Word is filled with the Word of Christ, but I think the strength of the woman at the well, powerful message, powerful. Absolutely. The, the blind man who's cured by Jesus, what that represents and the blindness we sometimes have in our humanness. And we have to let the Lord permeate our lives and let the Holy Spirit lift us up and get us to see some of the more difficult things around us. The world is not a pretty place for a lot of people. And I don't mm-hmm. want to be depressing, but I think Lent is a time we need to, to look under those stones, look under those rocks. That is, Father says, well, they're out in the desert. That's where we should be. Bishop, you talked about the three traditional pillars of Lent, which we hear about all the time, of course, fasting, prayer, and almsgiving. I'm, I'd just like to talk for a minute a little bit about fasting. That's we think of fasting during Lent of giving something up and almsgiving, of course. Almsgiving and, and prayer seem to be more natural for people. But fasting is something that you can do throughout the year, which is a tribute to our Lord as well. But people don't really think of it as doing that. The fasting, year. abstinence has become, you know, it, it's meat somehow. But so oh, many yeah. things we can abstain from. I think we live in a world that's very technological. Maybe we need to abstain from some use of that technology. And maybe parents, you know, kids might not, they resonate a little bit more with using their device than having, you know, a hamburger on Friday even. They're a little bit more involved in that. Those are certainly valid and have been for centuries. So I'm not saying, no, cut it out. But I'm saying we need to add sometimes on how we see that. Abstaining, fasting, almsgiving. Yeah, we have to get, and it's about money, but I think it's also about giving of our time, giving self to somebody who is alone, who that woman at the well, Jesus shouldn't have spoken to her, sat there and spoke with her for a while. You know, certainly Mm -hmm. gave of himself, and Christ did that over and over again. But that's the example for us. Father, what do you think of those things? Bishop, as you mentioned, you know, today's challenge is uh, technology, entertainment, distractions. There are so many distractions. And I think absolutely, which as you mentioned, you know, being able to to, to remove some of those distractions so we can listen, so we can hear the voice of God it makes such a big difference. And as you mentioned, almsgiving, prayer, these are the, the foundations to our spiritual life and give of ourself, not just in financial ways, but also in maybe service. Of course, the time and prayer that we make for the Lord. These are all important parts of the Lenten journey. Well, thank you both for your thoughts on Lent, which, as we all know, is drawing to a close as the Mass of the Lord's Supper begins on Holy Thursday, which is this Thursday, April 6th. But there are two very significant days in the church before Thursday, and those are Palm Sunday, which is this Sunday, and then here in the Diocese of Venice, the Chrism Mass, which will be on Tuesday here in the Diocese. Palm Sunday. Let's talk about Palm Sunday for a minute, Bishop. Okay. Palm Sunday, we commemorate when Jesus enters into Jerusalem. And this commemoration is most expressed by the palms that we carry. And I think we all learned as kids how to braid them or make a cross or make some kind of decorative thing with them. To this day, I think it sticks with us. Or if we get a palm in our hand, we remember that experience. But we have to, as adults, kind of let it fill us within what does it really mean. We also have the reading of the Passion. And we kind of all, we've heard the Passion read over and over again. But boom, it's going to be read on Palm Sunday at the Masses. You know, some parishes have the means to have a procession and they make very elaborate demonstration or enactment, let me put it that way, of what Christ went through. And we have to be aware of that. It was a celebration. They welcomed Christ there. Do we welcome Christ? Do we still see it in the same way? Palm Sunday is a welcoming of Christ. Do we dispose ourselves to open our heart, our soul, our mind? in receiving, okay, we waved the palms, but there was a lot more. There was a lot of joy that was involved in all of that celebration. Yeah, Palm Sunday, you know, that uh, experience of the gospel in which we go through the the passion of Jesus, it it allows us to really enter into the experience. And we have the, even the audience participating, right? There's the, the, the cries and crucify him, crucify him. And so really that whole experience of Palm Sunday helps us to enter into you know, not just as spectators, but as being a part of this whole experience of the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Yeah, there's a lot there. It's a beautiful and a very spiritual 
also look and say a heavy, you know, kind of experience as we go through this? Well, it launches Holy Week, and that's got to make a difference Absolutely. in our lives. Yes. I like how you put that. It is a very heavy mass. Palm Sunday, when we participate in that, it's always hard to say those words. We didn't talk about the Chrism Mass, though. You asked us yes, both the about mass, it. Yes, the Chrism Mass. Both important. I'd like you both to talk about the Chrism Mass, which I had never been to a Chrism Mass until last year working here in the diocese. And I have to say, it was very moving. Let's talk about what it is. I don't think everybody knows what the Chrism Mass is. It's a time where basically you have the blessing of the oils that will be used for the sacraments throughout the following year. And parishes bring their unused oils back or they dispose of them as they know how to. And they receive the new chrism oils. But that blessing of that oil takes place at that mass. And, you know, really it's a time for all the priests from the diocese to come together and be with their bishop, a sign of unity among the clergy, among those who offer the sacrifice of the Mass throughout the diocese. Year after year, we do that and have that, that symbolism. We don't get to see each other. We're a big diocese kind of spread out and long drive from one end to the other. Yeah, we have a few events in the course of the year, but I think this is always a special occasion for the priests to come, to be together. We have a lunch afterward. We honor those who have been, you know, uh, ordained 25, 50 years. And this year we have any number of 55 years and 60 years even. So we'll have to kind of reach out to them also and not let them think that isn't noticed by us all. I would just add, too, one of the special things about the Chrism Mass is the renewal of priestly vows. And as Bishop mentioned, it's uh, we come together in unity. It's the time as, as brother priests that we don't get to see each other too often throughout the year. So really is a time to come together, usually have a meal together afterwards. It really is a kind of a hopeful and, and um, just a beautiful time of yeah, unity, fraternity, and celebration. It was beautiful to see so many priests from the diocese all together in, in one place and on the altar. And a particular way to all come together, all praying one for the other. You know, I mm -hmm. think that's, I, at least Absolutely. I feel uh, at that event kind of, you know, Father mentioned the renewal of the priestly vows, but still, yes, we're together and we do that but to pray for the others mm -hmm. in the living out of those vows also. It's lovely. And Chrism Mass, Bishop, always happens during Holy Week. Is that correct? Yes, it does. And it really should be on Thursday. But the fact that Holy Thursday, priests have to be back in their parish. So we don't do, we pick another day in Holy Week and it's Tuesday. Right. And it, yes, ours will be in the Diocese of Venice on Tuesday, April 4th at 1030. So I encourage any listeners to attend. Uh, All are invited. All are invited, and welcome is at Epiphany Cathedral here in Venice, so we hope to see you there. Let's talk about the Paschal Tridum, which is a culmination of Holy Week and is really the most important week of the year for most Christians and certainly for Catholics. It is. You know, I think the Trinuum and Easter coming right there, it's a number of days. We know it happens over days, but it's almost a single event in many ways and needs to be in our lives. I think Christmas gets the big billing in the world because of the commercialness that's thrown at it. But this is really the day. Mm -hmm. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. It is the day in the life of the church and should be in the life of every one of us in that salvation is offered to us. Christ being born, I'm not taking away from that, but I'm just saying even he acknowledges what his role was to come into this world. It wasn't just to be born. It was an accomplishment. And God, his father, sent him his suffering, death, and resurrection. He can't pull any of those apart. They're all together. Mm -hmm. One without the other is incomplete, and it's not what Christ said he was doing. So we need to be attentive to that. So the Trinum, a very special time, I think, in the life of the church. It should be in the life of all the faithful, where we come together and we express and just spend some time talking to the Lord about who we are, who we strive to become going forward. Once again, acknowledging this resurrection, suffering, death, and resurrection. What are we going to do? How do we die with him in our lives? You are listening to Witnessing Faith with Bishop Duane on Relevant Radio. I'm Karen Barry Schwartz, Director of Communications for the Diocese of Venice in Florida. Witnessing Faith with Bishop Duane can be heard anytime at relevantradio.com and on the last Friday of each month on 1410 AM and 106.7 FM in Fort Myers and 1660 AM and 93.3 FM in Naples 
or anytime at dioceseofvenice.org slash our bishop. Father, let's talk about Holy Thursday as we go through these special days in the church. It often includes washing of the feet. What is the significance of that? And is that always done on Holy Thursday? Yes, uh, Holy Thursday. Well, there's a lot going on in Holy Thursday. You know, first we celebrate the institution of the Eucharist. This is the remembrance of the Last Supper, Jesus's final moments with his apostles and his final words to them. And so it's a, it's a very deeply moving celebration, focused on the gift of the Eucharist, the gift of his presence, body, blood, soul, and divinity there at the Mass, in the celebration of the Mass. And then, yes, there is the, the washing of the feet, and it's a symbol of, of service, of Christ's service to us and giving us an example to imitate in our service to one another, our service of love, our pouring out of ourselves, just as Christ gave himself for us. And of course, the next day is is Good Friday. It sometimes seems like a misnomer that it's called good when it's the day our Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. But of course, it is good. He died on the cross for us and for resurrection. And on this day, when we recall the Lord's passion, we pray the stations of the cross and reflect on Jesus's love expressed in his saving death for us. I remember so vividly always as a child going to Mass at three o'clock on Good Friday with my family. Is there significance to that time? It is the time that it's been calculated that Christ would have died approximately at that time on the cross. And they talked about how dark it got, and we hear the curtain is torn from top to bottom. You talked about stations of the cross in your comments. I think that's something that, well, through the Lenten season, I remember, once again, you're remembering, and I think these religious occasions bring us back to where we learned them, where we first experienced it. In the parish I was in, stations would be on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And sometimes on Sunday, that was how the the priest at the time did it. But I think Stations of the Cross, you learn that that's first coming in contact. And then it adds to one's understanding, I think it did when I was younger, of what is Good Friday, because you put that experience of each of those stations together. And that's, okay, Christ dies on the cross, but he's, he's living it out those days. And anyone who's ever gone to the Holy Land, you also go through, I think you've been there, Father. You go through that experience along Via Doloroso of all these stations and how it was for Christ. Maybe one of you can talk a little bit about the adoration of the Holy Cross on Good Friday. What is that about? And explain to our listeners a little bit about where that came from and what that is. Yes, the, the veneration of the cross is you know, one of the essential parts of the, of the Good Friday service. And I can tell you, as a priest, it, it is one of the most moving experiences of the, of the Triduum. As we invite the parishioners to come forward, to acknowledge whether maybe just to touch a part of the cross, to kiss or venerate in some way the image of, of the body of Jesus, they are crucified before them. And seeing the emotion that is in our parishioners' faces, the tears sometimes that is there, it can be just a, yeah, a deeply moving experience of entering into this incredible act of love of Jesus for us, his dying on the cross for us. You know, on that day, I think when people come, we at least I as a priest, and I remember as a layman, it, it struck me when the cross would come in and it's veiled with the purple cloth on it, sometimes red, but usually purple that day. And the deacon or the priest who's carrying it, you know, sings that out. This is the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior of the world. Come, let us worship. You know, to listen to that and let that, those words enter into your consciousness, into your soul, and let it carry you to where, you know, we need to be in responding to what is the significance of the cross. I think we see everybody wearing crosses so often, beautiful crosses, and some of them gold, and they're very decorative, men, women, everyone. What does it mean to them? I can't help but think sometimes that doing a confirmation, I see a person, or even Greeting faithful and they're leaving the church. If I see one that's pretty, wear that cross always. Do you know what it means? Particularly young people say that. And they're kind of stunned. They don't expect to say, you got to look that up. You got to know. Why do we wear that cross? And uh, hopefully it makes a difference. But anyway, I, I think it is important on that day that we truly teach and explain and demonstrate the significance. The emotion you mentioned, Father, with individuals seeing it, certainly it moves any priest when you see that. It's touching. And on Good Friday, it is always a, a crucifix, a cross with a corpus on it. Yes, it, it must right. be. Yes, and there should only be one in the church mm -hmm. for this celebration. I know sometimes people, well, you know, we're a big congregation with this, with that. So is everybody else. Have a cross there with a body, a corpus on the cross mm -hmm. to really represent. 
of all days, it should be that day. I was reading somewhere that it originated in the third century, that it was actually from a piece of wood from the actual real cross that was venerated. And priests, I don't know if this is true or not, but priests would would kiss it. But then when people came up to kiss it, when parishioners came up to kiss it, they'd be watched very closely to make sure they didn't try to take a bite out of it to get a piece of the real cross. Okay. I don't know if that's I haven't read that book. <laughs> I haven't was, read that book, but that was, uh, you know, supposedly. you can imagine, you know, after at a certain time, they just ran out of those pieces the of the cross mm. and those relics. But as Father said, to come up and touch it, to kiss it, some will genuflect, you know, whatever it is they choose. I think on that day, short of someone who's not able to really navigate well and fall, but let them do that what they wish to do to venerate. Very moving time. And then, of course, we move into the Easter Vigil or Evening Mass on Holy Saturday when we all keep really silent vigil, like the woman who sat facing Jesus' tomb as we await with hope the resurrection. And the Easter Vigil is always done when night falls. It's done in darkness. Yes, it should be done in darkness. And, you know, I think the ceremony used to be much longer. It says, end before sunrise the following day. Well, we have to get people home before that, I think. <laughs> You know, people had to travel a long distance past, and it took them a long time. But I mean, there should be no other celebrations that day. And usually at the Easter Vigil, you know, the the candidates and catechumens who have been welcomed into the church on the, the first Sunday of Lent, they did the rite of election. And this year here in the diocese, we had 567 combined between catechumens. Of that, 216 were catechumens meaning they have not been baptized. And the candidates, they've been baptized, but maybe not at all active in the church. Maybe even as a baby, they just were never brought to church again. But they want to reactivate that faith. And I think it's always interesting to hear the story and what inspired them. And sometimes there's no real reason but the grace and gift of the Holy Spirit. It isn't because they're getting married or their parents are making them do it or it goes on and on. Sometimes you have a child who became so inspired that that's why the parents are converting, because the child was the example, and the child asked them to go with him. That isn't by accident or just by whatever. I just think th that's living out the call of the Lord and accepting the prompting of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But I'm getting carried away. I'll get back to Holy Saturday now, those who come into the church. And I think, Father, you can speak of it as a, as a priest. I think it's moving for every priest that there's many parts to that celebration, even before that, the lighting of the candle, the readings that are held in darkness, so on and so forth. But when you get to instituting the sacraments to them, I think that's profound. Absolutely. And Easter Vigil, it's the high point of the liturgical year. And we pull out all the stops for this in the, in the Catholic Church in terms of the, of the, of the incense and the, the fire and the symbols, the Easter candle, the Paschal candle. The, the baptisms and, and so much of the symbols, water, fire, light, and darkness. And you know, I think light and, and darkness is really one of the, the major symbols of that celebration. It's a reminder of, of who Christ is. Christ is the light of the world. And he is the light that shines in the darkness. The darkness has not overcome it. The words from John's gospel. And he has such beautiful symbols that help us enter into this reality of Jesus's rising from the dead. It's a uh, yeah, beautiful celebration. And that's amazing, 567 of the elect entering the church. That's great, great and news. we all owe a prayer of thanksgiving to the Lord, the Holy Spirit, because it's not, our, it's not a human doing. It, it's mm -hmm. something spiritual yes. that happens. Certainly. And then, of course, is Easter Sunday, where often we are renewing our baptismal vows as parishioners on Easter Sunday. And it's not just, not just about the chocolate and the Easter bunny, which we also look forward to. <laughs> but uh, Easter Sunday is, is the culmination of our faith, as Bishop mentioned earlier. And there's the option in the Mass. You said renew our baptismal promises in the place of the creed. You, can, you do that. You can have a sprinkling throughout the church to kind of connect a little bit of that waters of baptism also, which we all have that experience, that sacrament. I think sacraments are so important. We have an encounter with Jesus Christ. We do many ways in life otherwise, but always in the sacrament, there's an encounter with Christ. And we have to be careful. We have to pay attention and not miss that. It's an opportunity, and we need to enter fully into it. Everyone does. Absolutely. Before we close, I'd like to talk a little bit about 
the week after Easter because we won't be together again before that, which is Divine Mercy Sunday. And I think not everyone is fully aware of of why that is so significant. Father, could you tell us a little bit about Divine Mercy Sunday, which is the Sunday that follows Easter or the Feast of the Divine Mercy? Absolutely, Karen. And if I could just go back, you know, as we approach Holy Week, coming now to these most sacred days of our liturgical calendar of the church year, you know, maybe our Lent hasn't been as good as we wanted it to be. You know, maybe it, you know, we've fallen short in our goals, our hopes for that. And as an invitation for all of us listening, you know, this is an opportunity to to give these days our full focus and attention to really enter into this experience. And if we do, the Lord will show up, the Lord will bless us, the Lord will will give us the grace and uh, and all that we're looking for. So it's an invitation in a, to all those listening to really make these days a special time. But as we go looking forward past that, we have this beautiful celebration of the mercy of God, Divine Mercy Sunday. And this was established by St. Pope John Paul II in the year 2000. And this was in response to the messages of our Lord to a Polish nun, St. Faustina Kowalska. And in these messages, he calls for the establishment of this feast of mercy so that all mankind can come to know the mercy of God. And, and we come to know this through some of the, the image of divine mercy, the image of Jesus, that, uh, the way that he appeared to her, Faustina, St. Faustina. And he appears to her in this vision with his right hand raised in a blessing, and his left hand touching just above his heart. And we see these red and white rays pouring out from his heart and symbolizing the blood and water poured out for our salvation. And and he asks of, uh, that, this, that these words, Jesus, I trust in you, be placed under this image and promise that the souls who venerate this image will be, receive many graces. And it's all part of this, this message of our Lord to Faustina. God desires our conversion, our hearts, our turning to him, and he will seek us out in any way. He, will, he wants to pour out his mercy upon us. And so we have this beautiful celebration that the church offers us right after Easter so that we can receive that mercy. And if you go to confession and then receive communion on Divine Mercy Sunday, a a great mercy is granted for you, correct? Yes, that's one of the the promises that the Lord makes that a person who goes to confession doesn't have to be there on the day, but it could be some days before or or even after, and receives Holy Communion on that day will receive absolute total forgiveness of their sins. So it's a beautiful gift. That is a great, a great, a great gift. And regarding the Sacrament of Confession, Bishop, we have diocesan-wide hours of confession this weekend. We do. This weekend, so on Friday, March 31st, from 4 to 8, all the parishes have been asked to be open and make the sacrament available to the faithful who want to come in for an individual confession. It isn't, you know, larger groups at the parish. Individual concession, so Friday night, 4 to 8, and then Saturday from 9 to 12, Saturday on April 1st. For those who may not be able to make it in the evening, they're off work on Saturday, can bring the family, maybe the kids will be home. It's a good time. Go to confession in that week. So that's great. So that's diocesan-wide, and you can certainly check with your local parish about additional opportunities for confession, but that's this evening from 4 to 8, and also tomorrow from 9 to 12. Your parish probably has additional confession times as well, but that is diocesan-wide. But Thank you, Bishop Dwayne and Father Eric Scanlon for joining us on our program today. Thank you very much. We've been talking about the Lenten journey and Palm Sunday, the Chrism Mass and Holy Week, all but Lent coming up next week. We're at the close of Lent and Divine Mercy Sunday right after. And as Father Scanlon mentioned, as Lent draws to a close, perhaps reflect on your own Lenten journey and ask yourself, how have you grown closer to God? How have you grown in holiness? I know those are the questions I'll be asking myself as the Lenten season draws to a close this year. And let us all give thanks to God for accompanying us in this season. And please say a prayer for all the elect who are waiting to be baptized into the church this Easter. I wish you all a blessed Holy Week and happy Easter. You have been listening to Witnessing Faith with Bishop DeWayne. I'm Karen Barry Schwartz, Director of Communications for the Diocese of Venice in Florida. Witnessing Faith with Bishop DeWayne can be heard here on Relevant Radio on 1410 AM and 106.7 FM in Fort Myers, and 1660 AM and 93.3 FM in Naples, or anytime at dioceseofvenice.org slash ourbishop.